we got blessings on blessings bless you you got blessings on blessings yeah we got blessings on blessings yeah 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 blessings on blessings yeah yeah blessings on blessings all praise to the most high y'all because he is definitely worthy to be praised i want to indeed give him honor and esteem uh, for being able to be before you once again today and deliver a message to you. So I want to give the Most High Yah and our King, Yahushua Mashiach, the respect and the honor that they are due. Mishpukha, I'm going to go ahead, and, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and put it out there. I'm going to shoot it to you straight. He's been showing me some things, Mishpukha, and I, you know, <laughs> I realized, he said, look, I'm not just showing, I'm not just showing it to you for you. No, I'm showing you this so you can go on and show this to my people. And, and I'm going to be obedient with that. So I'm going to go ahead and shoot it to you straight with what he's been showing me in this message um, that, that we're going to look into today. into this lesson that we're looking into today, I can't do it all in one message. I can't do it all in one lesson. So we're going to have to break this thing up. We're going to have to break it up. Um, and, and we're going to have to lay some foundations. Um, so this will be a multi-part uh, message, a multi-part lesson. So if you're watching this on the recap, if you're watching the review, actually, excuse me, if you're watching the recording of this video, then just know that there will be an additional part to this. And if you're here watching it live, be on the lookout for the additional parts of this because it's not going to be just one message. Um, earlier this week, I was having a conversation I was well, not a conversation. I was having a study um, with one of my ox, an up and coming uh, scholar in, in the Torah and in, in the scriptures. And I'm sure that you'll be seeing from him soon. Um, but we were doing a we were doing a study together, his family and I. And, um, you know, we were looking at a we were looking at a couple of passages. And one of the passages that we read stayed on my Ruach all week. And, and I'm going to show that passage to you. Um, Aki, go ahead and bring the scripts up. Let's pull up Luke chapter 15, verse 8. See, in Luke chapter 15, verse 8, Mashiach is given a parable, right? And, and this parable, when we read it, something jumped out at me. But as I meditated on it throughout the week, more and more things were jumping out to me. And I was like, whoa, hold on. Most high, what you trying to show me? And he started to show me and bring to remembrance some things that he had already showed me, uh, shown me and how they all parallel with each other. And he gave me some understanding and some insight that I didn't have before. And so today I'm going to share what the Most High has shared with me. I'm going to share it with you, Mishpaka. So in Luke chapter 15, verse eight, it says, either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she finds it. Family, I'm going to read that one more time. Either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose just one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she finds it. Now, immediately while we were having the study, the thing that jumped out to me, one of the things that jumped out to me was, notice here what had to be present for her to find that which was lost. In verse 8, the first thing that she does when she loses a piece of silver, it says that she lights a candle. Light had to be present for her to find that which she had lost. Family, you see, in the book of Genesis, it teaches us that Yahuwah said, let there be light, and there was light. However, there had yet to be a creation of a sun, moon, and stars. You see, in the book of Revelation, it says that when it's all said and done, that there will be no need for a sun. There will be no need for a moon because the, the splendor, the esteem of the Most High Yah, his presence and the Lamb will lighten the world. Nevertheless, in order for this woman to find that which she had lost, there had to be the presence of light. Okay, and 
right off the back, I'm not talking about just lighting the candle because see, this is a parable to help us understand something. And the second thing that had to be done in order for her to find that which was lost is, you got it, Aki, she had to sweep up. She had to sweep up. There were some things that were out of place in her life and in her house that she had to get straightened out. You know, there were some things in her life that no longer had place in her life or no longer had place in her home. And she had to throw those things out. She had to get rid of some things. She had to reposition and organize some things in her life to find that which was lost. You see, there were some things in her life that she had to reconcile with and she had to sit straight in order for her to find that which was lost. The text tells us that Yah told Hezekiah to get your house in order. But nevertheless, when the light was present and she cleaned her house and she sought diligently for what was lost, the parable teaches us that she was able to find that which was lost. And I can hear that woman saying in this parable, oh, oh, there it is. There it is. I've been looking for that. There it is. Now, family, don't misunderstand the fact that I understand that Mashiach, uh, Mashiach is using this parable to teach us how the kingdom rejoices over one who repents and turns back to the most high. But when I consider the three components that we find in this parable that were needed in order for this woman to find that which was lost, which was light, the cleaning of her house and seeking diligently, I do not count that as insignificant. So I got a question for you. Put, it in, put a 100 in the chat if you've ever done this. Have you ever put something down and looked around for it a thousand times or looked at it a thousand times when you didn't need it? And then the one time that you needed it, you couldn't find it. I mean, you put it down in the house and it's in your way. You move it around. You look at it every day. But the day that you need it, you cannot find it. And then when you find it, what you say is, it was right here in my face. <laughs> it was right in my face the whole time. Let me tell you what the old folks would have said. The old folks would have said, you better be glad it won't a snake because it would have bit you. That's what the old folks would have told us. But see, that analogy, what that analogy means is that the thing that you had been looking for, the thing that you had lost, the thing that you had been overlooking and you were now looking for and could not see it, it was hidden in plain sight. It was right in front of your face. And that is the title of today's message. Today's message is entitled Hidden in Plain Sight. And this is going to be part one of Hidden in Plain Sight. So throughout this week, I was meditating on this uh, parable and the Ruach HaKodesh began to show me some things. And I'm going to share them with you, but I can't do it all in this one message. OK, um, out of respect for your time. I don't have the time, nor do I have the ability to put everything that the Ruach HaKodesh has shown me into this message and do it justice. So we're going to split it up and we're going to just cover part one today. Um, let's go ahead and go over to Second Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to pick up at verse one and we're going to examine the account of one who's known as King Josiah, whose name is actually King Yoshiahu. Now, when I did the message uh, standing on truth, I did have a portion where I mentioned King Josiah um, and I mentioned it briefly because that's not what the message was actually about. But in hindsight, I said, you know what, there are some things that I need to go back and study in this account. There's some things that I need to go back and see. And I started to do that. And I, I went back and I started studying it, family. And when I started studying it, is when the Most High started to lay on my heart the foundation of what this, this message, this series of messages will be built on, which is entitled Hidden in Plain Sight. All right, so we're going to pick up um, at verse one. In verse one, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and 30 years. And he did that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah, and he walked in the ways of Dawid, his father and declined neither to the right 
nor to the left, excuse me, to the right hand, nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the Elohim of Dawid, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Yehuda and Jerusalem from the, um, from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the first key. The first key to today's lesson is the fact that Josiah began to seek Yahuwah. In verse, in verse three, it says, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the Elohim of Dawid, his father. So I got a question. I'm going to see who rolling with us early. How old was Josiah when he began to reign? It's in verse one. How old? Put it in the chat if you see how old. That's right. He was eight years old. Can you imagine being eight years old and taking the throne and becoming king of a nation? He was eight years old. OK, I got a, I got another question for you. How old was he when, be, when he began to seek Yahuwah? How old was he when he began? That's right. That's right. Y'all rolling with me. I see it in the chat. He was 16 years old. Oh, I remember back when I was 16 years old, and one of the things that I was not doing was seeking after Yahuwah. But this young king, this young king who had been on the throne since he was eight years old, at 16, he has a heart that begins to seek Yahuwah. And you see, the transition into righteousness begins with first seeking the Most High. It begins with seeking the most high. And, and we've said it time and time again, a lot of people's uh, transition into walking in righteousness or, or learning the ways of the most high. It starts with videos. It starts with conversation. It may not start with deep, uh, deep study, um, but nonetheless, they're seeking to know the most high. They're seeking to gain understanding. And what ends up happening is little by little, they begin to get an understanding of the most high. And after we begin to get an understanding, you know what comes next? The purge. The purge comes next. So I got another question for you. It's in verse three. It's in verse three. I'm going to give you the cheat code. How old was Josiah when he began to purge in Yehuda and Jerusalem? That's right. He was 20 years old. He was 20 years old when he began to purge. So who on the call remembers when they started to purge? I remember when I started to purge, you know, you start getting rid of everything. You start speaking against everything because you're on fire, you know, you're on fire. And you start to realize when you're in this truth, these things that I thought were true, these things that I thought had something to do with the most high. These things are not true. And so you begin to purge. Right. And so we see Josiah, when he turns 20, he begins to purge. Verse four, it says. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them. He cut down and the, uh, excuse me, the images that were on high above them. He cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed them to him. I mean, Josiah was cold with it. He purged harder than I did. <laughs> Verse five. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Yehuda and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali and their medics round about. And he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel. Um, excuse me. Yeah. And he returned to Jerusalem. Now, in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maasiah, the, gov uh, the governor of the city of Joah, to the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of Yahuwah, his Elohim. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of Elohim, which the Levites had kept the door, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and of all the remnant of Israel and of all Judah and Benjamin, and they returned to Jerusalem. 
And they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of Yahuwah. And they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of Yahuwah to repair and mend the house. So they were doing some renovations on the temple. They were doing some renovations on the house of the Most High. And Josiah set these things in order. Once he purged, he said, look, now what we're going to do is we're going to restore our place of worship. We're going to restore the house of Yahuwah. Verse 11, it says, even to the artificers um, and building gave they it to, to buy hewn stone and timber for couplings and to floor the houses which the kings of Yehuda had destroyed. So highlight it and put it in the chat if you see it. Highlight it, Aki. Who destroyed the house of Yehuda? Who destroyed the house of Yehuda? It's in verse 11. That's right. The kings of Yehuda. Ain't, ain't that something? Because see, when I started reading this text, the first question that I had was, why is he having to repair the temple? And I had to put the timeline together. And I'm like, you know, was this after an, uh, an invasion? Did, did the heathens come in and tear down the house of Yehuda? But I was shocked to find out that it was the kings of Yehuda that had destroyed the temple. We'll get more into that in just a second. Verse 12, it says, and the men did the work faithfully and the overseers of them which Jahath and Obadiah, the Levites, the son of Merari and Zechariah um, and Meshalam and the sons of the Korthites to set it forward and other of the Levites, all that could skill of instruments of music. Also, they were over the bearers of burdens and were overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service and of the Levites there were scribes and officers and porters. So I asked myself the question and I asked you the question, why is Josiah having to repair this temple? Why is he having to repair the place of worship? I can go ahead and go over to second Kings for, for um, context. Let's go to second Kings chapter 21 and pick up at verse one. And we're going to see something in second Kings chapter 21 verse one about Josiah's own granddaddy. OK, it's talking about Manasseh here. And Manasseh is Josiah's grandfather. It says in verse one, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. So he was a young king as well. And he reigned 50 and five years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hifzibah, Hif if I if I could say that correctly. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah after the abominations of the heathen whom Yahuwah cast out before the children of Israel. But watch what he did. Watch what he did. Verse three. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. And he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshiped all the host of the Shemaim and served them. And he built altars in the house of Yahuwah. He built altars. Not only did he build altars, he built altars in the house of Yahuwah, of which Yahuwah said in Jerusalem or Jerusalem, will I put my name? And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of Yahuwah. And he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of Yahuwah to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in his house, of which Yahuwah said to Dawid and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So in the place, in the very place where the Most High said, I'm going to put my name here. This place is designated for me. When you come to this house, this is the house of worship. This house belongs to me. In this place, Manasseh had the audacity to make this a house of idols. He didn't even go and hide and, and, and build his altars, you know, behind closed doors somewhere else. He put them in Yah's house. Drop down to verse 18, Aki. So we see that Josiah's granddaddy was wicked, right? He was wicked and he was doing some things in the house of the most high that were abominable. All right. Verse 18, it says, and Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house, in the garden of Uzzah and Ammon, 
his son reigned in his stead. So he has a son and his son comes on the reign. All right. Let's see what his let's see what his son does. Verse 19, it says, and Ammon was 20 and two years old when he began to reign. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Meshulameth, the daughter of Heruz of Jotham. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah as his father Manasseh did. So you see the wickedness of his father spilled over to him. And when he reigned in, 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 in his stead, when he reigned as king, he reigned just as wicked as his daddy did. Verse 21, it says that he walked in all the way of his father in all the way that his father walked in and served the idols that his father served and worshiped them. And he forsook. Don't miss this family. He forsook. That means that he turned his back on. That doesn't mean that he didn't know. It means that he turned his back on Yahuwah, Elohim of his fathers, and walked not in the way of Yahuwah. Toda Aki, let's go back over to Second Chronicles chapter 34, um, 34, verse 14. And see, we went and read that to get context of what exactly Josiah is dealing with. So generations of kings before Josiah had turned Yahuwah's house into a house of idolatry. And the reason that, that Josiah had to repair the temple was because it had been neglected for years. It had become run down. And not only had the temple or the house of the Most High become a place um, that was run down, it was become a, it had become a place of idols. People were going here not to worship Yahuwah. They had turned their back on Yahuwah and they had built things in the temple that were not in Torah to build in the temple. And when Josiah became king, Josiah said, look, we got to clean this up. We got to clean this up. You know, Yah had become a thing of the past to his people. It said that they that that um, the king had forsaken him. They they had turned their back on Yahuwah for other deities. And I'll be honest with you, family. This broke my heart when I read it. I mean, literally, when I read this, I began to shed tears just thinking about how our people treated our power and our Elohim, our protector and our provider, the one who, who rained down manna when we couldn't feed ourselves, the one that brought us out of the hand of oppression, the one that, that chose us to represent him, the one that fought our battles without us having to stand on the battlefield. When I read how our people had turned their back on the Most High, it brought tears to my eyes. Just reading the fact that they had turned this house that was supposed to be set apart, this house that was supposed to be a place of worship, this house that was supposed to keep our focus. I, I'm getting chills now just thinking about it. This house that was supposed to keep our focus on the most high, they had turned this into a house of idol worship and idolatry and had even neglected the upkeep of it, so much so that the floors had to be redone. We, family, we're not talking about some, we're not talking about some old wooden church here. We're talking about a temple with the doors and the walls overlaid with gold, with the vessels of gold and silver. We're talking about a, a, a wonder of the world and our own people, not even the heathen nations, our own people had allowed this place to become run down in a place of idolatry. Verse 14. It says, and when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of Yahuwah, Hilkiah the priest found, highlight this, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of Yahuwah given by Moshe. When you actually look behind it when it says given given by Moshe it, it actually says by the hand of Moshe you know um so is that saying that Moshe wrote this copy you know the chances the chances are high that Moshe did write this copy um but verse 15 I'll move on and Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe I have highlighted Aki found the book of the law in the house of Yahuwah and Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. Now, Hilkiah, who is a priest, 
Notice, notice the words that he's using. He's a priest and he keeps saying, I have found the book of the law or I have found the Torah. He keeps saying, I found it. He, he said it twice as if this it wasn't a it wasn't common to have a copy of the Torah in the temple. He says, I found it like. It wasn't a a a a copy that was made readily available to the people. You know, he's saying I found a copy of the book of the law as if the people uh, the people were not familiar with and did not know about the Torah. I mean, he's saying I found a copy of the book as if something, this book, this book of the law had been hidden in plain sight. You know, it's like, like this book, like this book, it, it's almost like this book that been laying around all of our lives. It's like this book of the law that had been around all of their lives. He's saying, I found it like nobody knew where it was at, nor did they consider. And the reason for that is because nobody had searched for it. Nobody was searching for it. Nobody had searched it out. So the instructions, just like this book, the instructions, the wisdom, the power of the book. See, it had been hidden in plain sight. It had been hidden in plain sight for years. And Hilkiah, who is a priest, when he runs across it, he's not saying here is a copy. He said, I found a copy. Now, it's not like the book of the law was buried or something. They didn't dig it up. They didn't go to a far place to, to find it. It was, it was actually right where you would expect it to be. Now, religion and everything to the side, family. Let's see, let's see if you all think the way that I think. Religion and religion and everything else to the side. If we didn't have a copy of the Bible in our homes, where would you where would you expect to find a copy of the Bible? Where would you where would you expect to find the book of the Bible if you didn't have one in your home? Religion and everything to the side. That's right, Aki. That's right. In the church, in the church, the, the, it, it's a no brainer. You you would expect to be able to go to a church and find a copy of the Bible if you were looking for one. So when they says that I found a copy of the book of the law in the temple, that should not have been a surprise. It was actually right where you would expect it to be. Verse 16, and Shaphan carried the book to the king. I like that. I'm going to touch on that too, Aki. He carried the book. He carried the book to the king. And brought the king word back again, saying, all that was committed to thy servants, they do it. He said, look, everything y'all sent us to do, we doing the king. I'm, I'm telling you, look, we done ripped those floors up. We put down new floors. We got new vessels that we're going to put in there. We done, tore our, uh, we done tore up the altars and tore down the idols and broke those down. We, we done done all of that. Everything you telling us to do, king, we've done it. But I got something I got to show you. Verse 17, it says, and they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of Yahuwah and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest have given me, highlight it, a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. He said, the priests have given me a book, a book, not the book. Not the book of the law, not the Torah, not the book of instruction, but a book. And family, what this tells me is, this tells me that Josiah and his crew weren't familiar with this book of the law. Because he didn't call it what it was. He didn't call it the book of the law. He said, look, he gave me a book and I'm going to read to you what's in this book. And I got an exercise for you if you don't believe what I'm saying. Take one of these. Take a Bible. Go to a three-year-old, not now, I ain't talking about some of these three-year-olds that's in the truth because some of these three-year-olds will tell you exactly what it is. But I'm telling you to go to a three-year-old who is not familiar with this and hold it up and ask them what this is and see if they tell you that, it, uh, that it's a Bible or see if they tell you it's a book. And the majority of them that are not familiar will tell you that it's a book because they have not been taught 
different. So this book of the law, this book of the Torah was actually something that was new. This was something foreign to Josiah and his crew. This was something foreign. All right. But here's why that is a problem. I keep give me Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14, because there is a big problem here. There's a big problem here. And here's what the problem is in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14. This the most high is given instruction for when they come into the land and they set up a king because he knew that they would do it. In verse 14, it says, when thou art coming to the land, which Yahuwah thy Elohim giveth thee and shall possess it and shall dwell therein and shall say, I will set a king over me. Like, like as all the nations that are about me, drop down to verse 18. Let's see one of the instructions that he gives for the king. In verse 18, it says, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest, the Levite. So he's supposed to, the king is supposed to write a copy of the Torah. He's supposed to write a copy of the Torah. The king is supposed to do that when he sits on the throne. He's not supposed to just read it. It says that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest, the Levites. So and go ahead and put your answer in the chat. I got a question for you. Do you think that the kings before Josiah had been doing that? Do you think that the kings before Josiah that we read about, do you think that they had been doing that? You think that they was copying, um, writing down a copy of, of, of the book of the law? Y'all think that the priests were making each king write down a copy before they sat on, why they, when they sat on the throne? You think the priests were holding them accountable to that? And I'm going to tell you why I don't believe so, because <laughs> Hilkiah used the words, I found. He didn't say I have. He didn't say I've kept. He said, I found a copy of the book of the law. Verse 19, it says, and it shall be with him, talking about the king, it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life. How many days were, was the king responsible for reading this book of the law? How many days was he responsible? All that's it, that's it. See, he can't see the king. He had a responsibility. He had to lead over y'all's people. He can't be like some of us today who feel like we're doing just enough because we 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 blow the dust off of our Bible once every two months and we read a couple of verses and we think we're good or or okay we do better than that. We pick it up once a month or we pick it up once a week. See, the king couldn't do that. The king was responsible for reading and we should be responsible for reading the book of the law all the days of our life. Why? That he may learn to fear Yahuwah, his Elohim, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left to the uh, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom he and his children in the midst of yasharal so y'all think these kings were keeping this commandment before Josiah like when they were when they were building these altars to worship to other deities in the house of the Most High Yah. Y'all think that they had just got through reading Torah, that they had been reading Torah every day of their life, and they took a break to go build these things? When they was creating uh, idols and, and sacrificing babies to Molech, y'all think that they were reading the Torah, studying the Torah every day of their life? You think that they had dedicated themselves and took the time to write out the Torah for them to study every day? And that the priests were holding them accountable? No, y'all rolling with me. No, it's, it's no way. Because you see, if they had been doing that, they wouldn't have been doing the abominations and the idolatry that they were doing at all, let alone in the house of the Most High Yah. Y'all think that they was <laughs> writing a copy of the Torah and studying it every day when they were celebrating Christmas, when they were celebrating Easter, 
when they had children bowing down to male reproductive organs and 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 when oh, I'm talking about us when we had children bowing down to male reproductive organs and when we had our children running after an Easter bunny that laid eggs and when we were practicing necromancy and consulting with witchcraft and and wizards in the form of horoscopes and things like that you think that we were actually doing what we were supposed to do and studying this book every day no no we we were just like those kings and so family listen i'm telling you when i read this book i gotta i gotta make it practical you know i gotta find the real world application i got to see myself so i can be renewed and i can be transformed so yeah look i got a word for those wicked kings but guess what each and every one of us or the majority of us have been on that same side of the fence we won't study in this word every day and because of that we fell victim to the snares of the enemy but you know what made the difference between Josiah and the kings before him? You know what made the difference? Because see, Josiah, he didn't he didn't have a copy of the book of the law anyway, because they didn't bring it to him. And he didn't look at that. Oh, I got that. Yeah, I got that. Let's look at this verse. Let's look at this chapter. Let me show you. He didn't do that. It was something new to him. But you know what made the difference between him and the kings before him? Hallelujah. All praise to the Most High when he was 16 years old. Put it in the chat if you know what happened when he was 16 years old, when he was 16 years old, sitting on the throne as a king. At a young age, the text tells us that he began to seek Yah. He began to seek the most high. And that was the difference, Mishpacha. That was the difference, family between Josiah and the kings before him, the kings prior to him. He had a heart. He didn't have the understanding yet, but he had a heart for the most high. So at 16, when we was trying to do a sweet 16 birthday party, at 16, Josiah was seeking out the most high. And, and it's like the most high told him, because you're seeking me, I'm going to show you my ways. I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm going to reveal to you something, Josiah, that has been hidden in plain sight. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you something, family. And this is something that, that the Most High showed me when I went back and studied this again. The book of the law was not hidden in plain sight because Yah chose to hide it and he didn't want his people to find it. You see, the, the, the book of the law, the Torah, just like this book, it was overlooked because the hearts of man had forsaken and not considered the Most High. You see, because their hearts had turned and they had turned their backs to the Most High, they didn't even, they didn't seek out Torah. They didn't seek out the book of the law. They didn't even seek out the Most High. So it was because of their hearts, they were able to overlook it. Remember, they were going to the temple to worship other deities. They were going into the temple to worship other deities. The book of the law was found in the temple. But it was hidden to them because they weren't looking for it. They didn't have a heart to, to search that out. They, they weren't looking for that. You know, you know, something that was supposed to be general and public knowledge was now hidden. Not by Yah, but by the hearts of man. Let me show you what the Most High says about hiding his word. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and pick up at verse 9, Aki. Because, yeah, they couldn't find it, but it, it wasn't because it was buried somewhere. It wasn't because it was in a land far off. It wasn't because it had failed and it was it was in the sea and they had to get some divers to go in and get it. No. See, verse nine of Deuteronomy chapter 30, it says, And Yahuwah thy Elohim will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land, for good. For Yahuwah will again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If, Akifa, no, I love this word right here. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of Yahuwah, thy Elohim, to keep his commandments and his statutes, where are we highlighted, which are written in the book of the law. And if thou turn unto Yahuwah, thy Elohim, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. For this commandment, which I command thee this day, <laughs> is it hidden? 
Is it hidden, Mr. Is it is it wrote? Is it written in a way that nobody can understand it? Is the commandment that he gave that day, is it somewhere buried that we got to go search it out and we got to go dig it up? Is it hidden in some cave? I don't think so. It says that it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in the Shemaim that thou should say, who shall go up for us to Shemaim and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Verse 14, but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou may do it. So what I learned, family, it's the hearts of man that, that caused them to overlook this book of the law. You see, it's the hearts of man that causes the wisdom the power of this book to be hidden in plain sight. It's the heart of man that causes them to have eyes but not be able to see. It's their hearts that, that, that causes them to have ears and not be able to hear the words of the Most High. It's not because he's hidden it from us. Our hearts prevent us from searching it out and finding it. So because our hearts are wicked and because our hearts um, causes us to overlook or to turn our back on the most high and causes us to not search out his Torah, the Tanakh, the Besor, the epistles, collectively what we know as the Bible, because, because the hearts of man is wicked, it causes our people to overlook this every day. And it causes the words of the scriptures to be hidden in plain sight. But it's because they don't want to see it. They don't want to see it, family. And you got, you got, look, they come in all flavors. You got people who they want to accept the New Testament, but they don't want to accept the Torah. They don't want to accept the law. They don't want to see it. And because their hearts have blinded them, they can't see it. Then you have those who accept the Torah, but don't accept the, the, the quote unquote New Testament. They, they don't accept the Shiach and they say, I can't see it. You know, you can open the book and show it to somebody plain as day. If they're an Old Testament only, you can show it to them in the New Testament. If they're a New Testament only, you can show it to them in the Old Testament and they can't see it. And it's all because of the heart. It's all because of the heart, family. And because the heart is wicked, they don't want to see it. I keep go ahead and go back to uh, Second Chronicles chapter thirty-four. Pick up at verse nineteen. And so what I realized is Hilkiah being a priest is saying, "I found a book of the law, and it was foreign to them. It was something that they were not familiar with because the hearts of the people and the hearts of the king before them had turned the nation away from looking toward and looking for that. Because had they not been turned away from Torah." <laughs> they would have read that passage in Deuteronomy that said that each king had to write a copy of it and keep it with them every day and study it every day so that their hearts would not turn away from the Most High. Verse 19, it says, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. He, he rent his clothes. He tore his garments. And, and I'm going to tell you, I'm willing to bet him as the king. They want no cheap garments he had on. He he look, he probably had on the best of the best, but it says that when he read, when when he heard the words of the book of the law, he ran his garments. And that is a second major key, family. That is a second major key. You see, the words of the book that had been hidden in plain sight made him rent his clothes. He's, he knew immediately. He knew immediately how off track Israel had gone. And it saddened him. And not only did it sadden him, it frightened him so much that he, he rent his clothes. When they found out what had been hidden in plain sight, Mishpaka, which means family, they knew that they had it all wrong. And because of that, he rent his clothes. And, and, and just like that, 
when we fix, when we really get into this truth, when we really start studying this book and we really start walking in the truth, we realize that we had it all wrong. Right. And that's where that purge comes in that, that I was talking about earlier. We realized that we had it all wrong. And and when the truth is revealed to you, it's supposed to do something to your heart. It's supposed to do something to you. It's supposed to do something to your heart. I mean, when you really find the truth that has been hidden in plain sight, you're supposed to rend your garments. You're supposed to rip your garments. And now I'm not talking about a rustler. I'm not talking about pulling a Hulk Hogan and, and ripping your shirt out. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about a Joel chapter two, verse 12. That's what I'm talking about, family. I'm talking about a Joel chapter two, verse 12. Because see, in Joel chapter two, verse 12, this is what it truly means. In Joel chapter two, verse 12, it says, therefore, also now, saith Yahuwah, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. See, you're supposed to turn to the Most High in fasting, in weeping, in mourning, in prayer, in study. Verse 13, here it is. And rend your heart, not your garments. Family, when you really find this truth, it should do something inside of you. It should, it should do something to inspire you to rend your heart. It says, rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto you who your Elohim, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the, uh, excuse me, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. You can go back to second Corinthians chapter 34 and pick up at verse 20. You see, it don't do no good for us to rend our garments when we're going to turn around and go buy more garments. Right. We're going to put more. We we rip it for show and then go get some more garments. You know, that's not what it's about. It's about actually rending your heart, rending that thing that caused us to cause our forefathers, that caused our people to forsake the house of Yahuwah, to forsake the most high, to turn their back on him. That heart that's wicked of all things, that's desperately wicked and that none know rending that thing. And as somebody just put it in the chat to have true repentance. You know, we talked about the purge earlier, um, and I asked you all to put some things in the chat. Uh, if you remember when you when you started to purge, you know, uh, put some things in the chat that you may have done when you started to purge. And I remember that one of the things that I, I did when I started to purge was I, I, I came across the dietary laws that were in the book of the law that were hidden in plain sight. Same Bible, nothing new. When I came across the dietary laws, I went in the freezer. And everything that we were not supposed to be eating, it had to go. It had to go. My wife was looking at me like, you, like, are you crazy? Look, it's got to go. And I'm throwing it out. Right? Look, I'm going to tell y'all how serious I am about this thing. My family, my family will tell you, I don't even buy treats for the dog that has anything in it that we're not supposed to eat. It's got to go. It had to go. And I immediately went on a on a purge fest. OK, I immediately went on a purge fest. And, and that's kind of what Josiah was doing when he was tearing down the altars and he was tearing down the idols. But, you know, I say that to say this. When we start our purge, the first thing that we start with is we, we start the purge on the outside. The things around us, we, we begin to uh, try to eat better. We begin to start keeping Shabbat. We do away with our crosses on our necklaces. We do away with our idols. We do away with keeping the holidays and, and, and all of those things. And, and that is great, family. That is great. That is exactly what you're supposed to, to uh, supposed to do. But listen to me closely. Do not start your purge on the outside. And forget to purge what's on the inside. It don't do us no good to go out purging all of these things around us and we're still wicked and have abominations on the inside. And that's what I mean by we have to purge our hearts. We have to rend our hearts just like Josiah ran his garment. We have to rend our hearts. It's great to start on those things on the outside, but at, on the outside. But at some point, family, we got to start looking at what's on the inside. And that's why I started with that parable of how the light had to take place and that woman had to sweep up around her house. 
man, that's a whole Hebrew lesson about the house and the bet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole Hebrew lesson. But but what's on the inside, the bet in Hebrew, the house, is, is what's on the inside. Your heart, the authority on the inside. We got to sweep that up. All right, let me get back to my message. Let me get back to my message before I go off on a tangent. Uh, verse 20. Verse 20, it says, and the king commanded Hilkiah and Akikum, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, uh, Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the kings, saying, Go inquire of Yahuwah for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Yehudah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of Yahuwah that is poured out upon us. Because our fathers have uh, have not kept the word of Yahuwah to do all that is written in this book. And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Huda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tipka, the son of Has uh, Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college and they spake to her to that effect. So the college here, family, I'm going I'm to I'm touch on that for a second. The college is somewhere where the, I'm going to call them the junior priests, you know, uh, the lower level priests that, that were not high priests, were not upper level priests. This is where they would reside. And it's called the college because it was a place that these priests would actually be in training. OK, and this this female prophet or prophetess, uh, Huda, she resided in the college. In verse 23, it says, and she answered them, thus saith Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, tell ye the man that sent you to me, thus saith Yahuwah. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Yehuda. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense of, uh, to other deities that they may provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. Family, long story short here, there's a price to pay for overlooking the instructions of the Most High. There's a price to pay for turning your back on the Most High. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18, it tells us something. And that's why I said the IQ was already in my notes when we were starting up. Numbers 14 and 18, it tells us that Yah is merciful. He's slow to anger. But you know what else it tells us in Numbers chapter 14, verse 18? It tells us that Yah ain't nothing to play with. It says that Yahuwah is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. There's a price to pay when we intentionally choose to overlook the Most High. When we intentionally choose to turn away from him, there's a price for it. And I can remember family. I can remember trying to witness to somebody and trying to show them some things in scripture because they asked me to. They asked me to now. I, I didn't spark this conversation. They asked me to. And, and when I started to, excuse me, when I started to show them these things that were in scripture, it began to condemn them. And, the, and I asked them, I said, look, do you want to make it into the kingdom when it's all said and done? Or, or are you OK with being destroyed? And this person's response to me was. I just want to live my life. I just want to live my life while I have a life to live. And so. You can live your life. You can live your life however you want to live it. But the fact of the matter is, in the long run. If you continue in your wickedness, there's going to be a price to pay for it. So go ahead. If you just want to live your life, you don't care about what's in the book. You're just like those other kings who chose not to uh, write a copy of the book and chose not to study it every day. If you're not going to pick up your scriptures every day and try to learn something and try to better yourself, thus saith the most high. If you're going to live your life in comfort, wanting to do what you want to do, do your thing. I'm not going to argue with you, but. When the opportunity presents itself, if we have the conversation, I'm going to show you, thus saith the Most High. So Yah tells Josiah, he says, look, Josiah, your people wicked. 
your people are wicked. And, and when I say they wicked, I mean they are wicked. And judgment is coming. You can't, you can't, you can't get around that. Okay. Yeah, your your people are at the point of no return, and they they're going to have to be judged because per my Torah, I told them if they do the things that they are doing in my house, and if they do the things that they are doing in my presence, I'm going to punish them. So judgment is coming, Josiah. But uh, Aki, let's let's jump over to the book of Zephaniah and pick up. Um, we're gonna pick up at the first verse. Now, Zephaniah is a prophet who prophesies during the reign of King Josiah. Okay, and we're going to the book of of Zephaniah to get a more in depth understanding of Yah's judgment on Israel. Um, you see, because of their wickedness, Yah said, "I'm going to do something," and in Zephaniah. It, he gives a little bit clearer detail to what y'all plans to do. All right. So Zephaniah chapter one, verse one, it says that the word of Yahuwah, which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Am uh, Amariah, the son of Hiskiah, the uh, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Yehuda. So we see that Zephaniah is prophesying during the reign of King Josiah. Verse two, it says, I will utterly consume all the things off the land, saith Yahuwah. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fish of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith Yahuwah. I will also stretch out my hand upon Yehuda and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Kimmerim with the priests. Now, the Kimmering, without going too deep into it, were a, a sect, if you will, or a, a category of priests to Baal. All right. Um, and so he's he's basically saying, I'm going to separate my priests and my people from the priests of Baal. Verse five, it says, and them that worship the host of the heaven upon the housetop and them that worship and that swear by Yahuwah and that swear by Malcolm. I'm going to I'm going to make a division. Verse six. And them that are turned back from Yahuwah and those that have not sought Yahuwah nor inquired of him. So those that are not seeking the most high, he says, look, Josiah. <laughs> they got to go. They got to go. They got to get this judgment. They got to get this. They got to get this belt. They got to get this whooping because they too far gone. Jump over to chapter two. Verse three of Zephaniah, Aki, because he doesn't leave us without hope. Zephaniah doesn't leave us without hope. And he says something in verse three of chapter two. He says, seek ye Yahuwah, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgments. Seek his righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be. It just may be. It just may be. Uh, and it may be. Ye shall be hid in the day of Yahuwah's anger so just like the most high is telling josiah look your people they're going to be judged zephaniah is saying look if you have the heart to just like that woman that lost that piece of silver to seek diligently if you have that heart to seek the most high it just may be that in that day of judgment that he just may hide you so the Aki, jump back over to uh second chronicles 34 pick up at verse 26 all right and in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 26, it says, And as for the king of Yehuda, who sent you to inquire of Yahuwah, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim of Israel concerning the words which thou hast heard. All right. So when they read that book of the law to Josiah and, and he rent his garment and he sent them and said, Inquire of Yahuwah for me. When, when, when they went in and inquired to Huda, Huda told them, Look, Judgment is coming on this people. The Most High said he's going to judge this people because they're wicked and he's going to consume them off the land. Not only is he going to consume them, he's going to separate those who seek him diligently um, and those who have sought out Baal and those that have sought out idolatry. Right. But he says, I want you. The Most High tells who to tell the, the servants of, of Josiah. I want you to tell Josiah something about him. Though. I want you to tell Josiah something about him. Verse 27, because thine heart was tender and thou, and thou did humble thyself before Elohim when thou heard his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof 
and humble thyself before me. So it says that Josiah, when he heard the words, he humbled himself. And so Josiah didn't, he didn't stand with his chest out proud because he was a king. You know, he didn't look at everything that he had. He didn't look at everything that he accomplished and stood proud with his chest out. It says that when he heard the words, he humbled himself and did rend thy clothes and weep before me. I have even heard thee also say of Yahuwah. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. So they go back and they tell Josiah the exact same thing that the Most High uh, speaks through Zephaniah in chapter two, verse three. He says, look, because you sought me out, because at 16 years old, you had a heart to seek me. And at 20 years old, when you heard the book of the law read that you rent your garments or you rent your heart and you repented and you had a heart to, to find me out and to search me out. He said, because of that, I'm going to hide you from the evil that I'm going to do to this place. That's right. Mercy. The, he started us off the day talking about mercy. The most I said, I'm going to be merciful. I'm going to be merciful on you. Because Josiah took heed to the words that were found in a book that were hidden and that was hidden in plain sight for years. The most High says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of my judgment. Miss Bakar, that's a hallelujah moment. Ain't that amazing? Ain't that amazing that that something that people have been overlooking every day. Something that people chose to avoid because they wanted to live their best life. Something that has been hidden in the plain sight from people because what's in their heart was the very thing that kept them turning from the most high. Something that was in a book that was hidden in plain sight was the very thing that kept Josiah from seeing the hour of judgment of the most high. That's that's a hallelujah moment. That's all praise to the most high for being for being merciful. Uh, verse 29. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Yehuda and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of Yehuda and all the men of Yehuda and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he read in the ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of Yahuwah. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before Yahuwah to walk after Yahuwah and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which were written in this book. Verse 32, and he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. He held them accountable. It said that he caused all of them to stand to it. That's right. That's right, Iman. Hear and do. He heard the words, but not only did he hear the words, he got active. Okay. It says he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and in Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of Elohim, the Elohim of their fathers. Excuse me, uh, according to the covenant of Yahuwah, the Elohim of their fathers. This is the third major key. The third major key is when, when the revelation was given to Josiah. When, when what was hidden in plain sight was revealed to Josiah, he used that for reformation of his people. Josiah, he shared what was revealed to him with his people the book of the law or the book of the torah which is the book of instruction that was hidden in plain sight you see when it was when it was revealed to him he didn't just keep it for himself he didn't say look y'all done told me i'm good i got mine they got to get theirs you know if they want to get out of the coming judgment they got to get there he didn't do that he didn't do that what was revealed to him he shared with his people he shared what had been found with his people and family i say that to say this y'all has not revealed his truth to us. Yah has not revealed his way to us 
for us to keep it to ourselves. Yeah, you see, Yah has revealed these things to us. He's revealed what has been hidden in plain sight for us to share it with others. And family, I heard it in a song and, and I love it. We have to do our part to make sure that we're, he we're helping this book of the law or the Torah or the instructions of the Most High. We have to do our part to make sure we're helping that go viral. We have to make sure that we're doing our part to help that go worldwide. And that's why we're here today. That's why we labor over this word. That's why we stand before you and give you the word that's coming straight out of the book, because we're trying to do our part with what the Most High has shown to us so it can benefit a reformation of our nation. You see, when the book of the law was given to Josiah, he first, he, he, repented and he chose to share what was given to him so it could reform his people soon as he had it together and, and he was in good standing he said now i'm gonna go share it with my people and so we have to make sure that we're dedicating some portion of our life in some form of fashion it doesn't have to be in teaching you know it, it can be in your walk it, it can be through giving alms it can be through prayer we have to make sure that we're dedicating some portion of our of our life to share uh, to sharing the things that are hidden in plain sight that others may not see and it's for the greater good of the reformation of our nation but see our nation and please don't mistake what i'm saying for for the united snakes of america our nation our lineage our nation can only be reformed by returning to the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. It can only be reformed by reestablishing our covenant and abiding by our covenant that we that our forefathers had with our Elohim and, and us walking in that same covenant. Verse 33. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertain to the children of Israel. And made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve Yahuwah their Elohim. And all his days they departed not from following Yahuwah, the Elohim of their fathers. Last precept, and I'm going to get ready to bring it to a close. Isaiah chapter 55, let's pick up at verse 6. This is my last precept, and, and this is what this whole message is about, family. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. Seek ye Yahuwah while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto Yahuwah and he will have mercy upon him and to our Elohim for he will abundantly pardon him. Man, the Ruach works in powerful ways. My Aki opened this up today talking about the mercy of the Most High. But you see, you can only access the mercy of the Most High if you are seeking him while he can be found. Family, the understanding and the knowledge of the Most High is found right here in his word. It's found right here in his word. And, and this understanding, this power, this knowledge of the Most High's word has been hidden in plain sight from our people for many generations, far too long. And it's not because the Most High didn't want us to find it. It's because the hearts of men chose to overlook it. It's been the same Bible, same set of scriptures, the same Bible that mama had, same Bible that daddy had, same Bible that grandma and granddaddy had, same Bible. But the only difference is the state of our hearts today. Are we woke now? All praise to the Most High, Yah, hallelujah. We woke now. We searching for the Most High today. We searching for him now. All praise to the Most High. And see, at this moment, at this very moment, prophecy is being fulfilled and our nation is returning back to its Elohim one by one. And, and all praise to the Most High. We are considering his ways. And so what I'm trying to encourage you to do Today, family, is stay the course. Stay the course, Mishpachah. Don't get distracted. 
Don't look at what's going on in the world. Yeah, the, the world is going downhill slowly but surely. Judgment is coming on the world. But but just like in that Zephaniah 2 and 3, we got to make sure that we've turned from our ways and we're focused on the Most High. Because if we seek out the Most High with all of our hearts, if we seek him out with all of our hearts, then family, he's going to hide us from that hour of judgment, just like he told Josiah. Continue to seek after the most high while he can be found because he can indeed be found, family. He can be found. You found him. You found him. I found him. And, and if you feel like you have not found him yet, I know that you're seeking because that's why you're here today. You're watching this video right now because you are seeking the most high. Continue on that course. Stay the course. But remember that while we're seeking him, we got to we got to continue to rend our hearts which simply means that that's a, a fancy way of saying we got to repent. We got to be just like Josiah. We got to recognize, look, we got it wrong. We've had it wrong and we have to repent and we have to turn to the most high. Yah. And if we do so, if we do so, I believe in my heart that the most high will continue to show us the things that have been hidden in plain sight that it may keep us from the hour of, king, uh, of judgment, just like it did King Josiah. So family, this is going to conclude, uh, con conclude, conclude rather, part one of today's message, which was titled, Hidden in Plain Sight. And, and this message is about finding the Torah. It's about finding the book of the law. It's about the Torah, the same Torah, the same book of the law, the same set of scriptures, the same Bible, if you will, that had been hidden in plain sight from the world for so many years. But all praise to the Most High, we found it. We found it, but when we find it, we got to get active, just like King Josiah. And remember, family, that you're not the crazy one. You're not the crazy one because you, you start keeping Torah and you start separating from some things that the world don't separate from and you start doing things that the world don't do. You're not the crazy one. They the crazy one. What it is, family, is that you are seeing things that are hidden in plain sight. You see things that they can't see because their heart has led them astray. So keep fighting the good fight, family. For the conclusion of um, this account with Josiah, you can go on in, in Second Chronicles and read chapter 35. Um, it records Josiah reinstating the Passover. Um, it records him reinstating the Levitical priesthood. It also records him... Um, having one of the greatest Pesach feasts, one of the greatest Passover feasts ever known to man. Go read about it in that chapter 35. It's really amazing. Uh, Akim, y'all think we're going to be able to top him this upcoming Pesach? Y'all think we're going to be able to top King Josiah? I don't know. I, I don't know if we got the resources to top him, but we're going to try. We're going to give it all we got. We're going to give it all we got, and it's going to go down in the record of, of one of the greatest Pesachs that, that is ever known to man, I by y'all willing. But for your own studies, for a more detailed account of Josiah's reform, you can read 2 Kings uh, chapter 22 and 23. Today we study in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 34 because it, it condenses this lesson. It condenses it. And, and so out of respect for uh, everyone's time, we, we chose to use 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Um, you can also go and read the book of Zephaniah. Uh, remember, Zephaniah was a prophet in the time of King Josiah. Also, multiple chapters of, of uh, Jeremiah pertains to the timing of, of King Josiah and his reign. Um, and we encourage you to go study these things on your own time. You know, study them on your own time and see what the Most High shows you. And we also encourage you to come back to this video. Come back to this video and in the comment section, enter, enter some of your findings. Put some of your findings in the comment section and show us what the Most High has shown you. Because iron truly indeed sharpens iron. And, and what you put in the comment section very well may, may help us to grow in our understanding. And it may show us something that was hidden in plain sight that even we didn't see. So we encourage you to, to go back and do some studying on your own on the account of King Josiah and come back to the comment section and, and let us know what the Most High has shown you. So with that being said, I pray that something was uh, said that was edifying. I, I pray that something was said that was inspiring. I want to give all praise, all esteem, and all honor to the Most High Yah and to our King, Yahushua Mashiach. And I thank each and every one of you for joining us today. And I want to bid you shalom. And I look forward to seeing you for part two.
of hidden in plain sight. It's going to get deeper, family. It's going to get deeper today. We were just laying the foundation, but it, it gets deeper. So all praise to the Most High Yah. Shalom. We got blessings on blessings. You got blessings on blessings. Yeah, we got blessings on blessings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, blessings on blessings. Yeah, yeah. Blessings on blessings.